our first talk is by uh, Paul Gulls. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, please correct me. Uh, Paul will talk about his work on fair algorithms for selecting citizens' assemblies. Uh, a little bit about Paul. Uh, Paul is a PhD student in computer science department at uh, CMU and is advised by Ariel Pocaxia. Paul's research applies tools from AI, algorithms, and game theory uh, to help society make better decisions. A specific interest of his are emerging forms of democratic participation and how these processes can be supported by axiomatic and algorithmic analysis. Okay, take it away, Paul. Thank you. Um, Can you guys see my screen? Okay, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you everybody for being here. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to present some joint work with Bailey Flanagan, Anupam Gupta, Brett Hennig and Arya Prokacia. This talk is on fair algorithms for selecting citizens assemblies. And I would like to structure this talk really around this title and unwrapping it bit by bit. First, I will talk about what citizens assemblies are. They're a new way of involving citizens in making uh, public decisions. And I will explain a bit why we're excited about it. Then I will talk about a specific problem, how to select these citizens assemblies and about the algorithms that were in place before we started our project. Then finally, I will talk about our contribution in a few minutes, which is to, um, to develop a new set of algorithms that are provably fair and in this way can hopefully uh, put citizens assemblies on a firmer foundation. So what are citizens assemblies? When I'm thinking back to recent news, maybe news about COVID policy, something that often seems to be in the background is an assumption that making policy decisions is really hard and is something that should be left, maybe it should best be left to professionals. And citizens assemblies really are based on a completely opposed philosophy. They are based on the premise that if you take a random sample of citizens and you put them in a room and you so support them in their deliberation, that they can come to good conclusions, make good recommendations that are both qualified and are supported by a broad set of, of people in the population. So this is an example of this working. Uh, this is the Citizens Assembly in Ireland in 2016. And what you see here is 99 randomly selected Irish citizens. They've come together here, they read a lot of materials over 18 months, they uh, question scientists, they spend a lot of time debating in these small table groups under professional moderation, and spend a whole lot of, idea, a whole lot of time exchanging their ideas and their, their opinions uh, between these groups. And finally, they made a set of recommendations. The most prominent recommendation that they made to the legislature was to uh, legalize abortion in Ireland which then passed by referendum. And in this way, the Citizens' Assembly was a crucial step in changing the Irish constitution. Ireland is one prominent example, but recently there has been a big surge in Citizens' Assemblies all over the world. Let me just give you a few more examples. So Ireland was in 2016. France had a very high profile Citizens' Assembly in 2019 on climate change. But for example, also uh, Mongolia, ever since 2017 has had a law that any change to their constitution had to be accompanied by a citizens' assembly. So this shows that citizens' assemblies are not only something that, um, that is only for the West or only done by the West, but they really have an appeal all over the world and a lot of different regions are experimenting with this now. A final citizens' assembly that I would like to touch upon is one in the United States in 2019. I won't even talk about what they discussed, but I would just like to give you a few seconds to look at these faces here. What is striking to me about these faces is they look very different from any other collection of faces I've ever seen in one place. And they look very different from the faces who typically weigh in on policy decisions. And that maybe can give you a hint of why we think that it's really worth experimenting more with ways of uh, democratic decision-making that involve such a broad coalition of people. And, um, and this is why, why we're excited about this application and why we hope to support this process and this uh, experimentation. So far, I've mostly talked about citizens' assembly in general and why we're excited about them. 
I will now focus a bit more on the specific process that we can weigh in on as computer scientists. And this is the process of selecting citizens' assemblies, which you might have also heard about as sortition. So how are these citizens' assemblies selected? Well, ideally, this would be a very simple problem. Uh, you have your population, and you know the size of the panel that you want to, want to achieve, maybe 99 citizens, and you would just choose uniformly without replacement. And this process has some very nice properties. Uh, every person in the population has an equal probability of being selected, of having their voice heard, great. Uh, we also know that any group in the population has nice statistical guarantees. So uh, whether it's women or people with a handicap or uh, people in a certain income bracket, everybody will in expectation have their fair share on the panel. And by concentration, it's much more likely that they will be accurately represented than, the, uh, than them being un unrepresented. So this is great. And a fair deal has been written about this in the political theory literature. Unfortunately, though, it is a few steps removed from what actually happens in practice right now. And the complication is very simple because most people don't have the time and don't have the willingness to actually commit to something that takes weekends for 18 months out of their life. And so the process as it works right now actually has more stages. In the first stage, the organizers of a citizens assembly will contact a random subset of the population. We call them the letter recipients here. They might receive a piece of random mail. Sometimes they're also invited by telephone and they're invited to opt into the process. So then in the second stage, a subset of the letter recipients will agree, they will opt into this pool of volunteers. They will register that they're willing to serve on the panel if selected. And then all the way on the top, we have the last step. And this is done by what we call a selection algorithm. The selection algorithm will take this num desired number of, uh, of uh, panel members and will choose them from among the pool members. The tricky bit here is that we want this panel to be representative of the population. And the pool certainly isn't because the pool is heavily skewed towards the groups that are more likely to respond to an invitation. Specifically, we know that people with higher education and older people tend to be vastly overrepresented in the pool. So if we want to not just represent these biases, but actually get to a representative panel, uh, to do that, uh, organizers impose a whole range of quotas. They might say, between 48 and 50 of these panel members should be women. And between two and four members should come from the state of Massachusetts and so on. And you should really think of this as a long list of requirements that any panel has to satisfy. And this maybe hints at the fact that this selection algorithm is solving a hard algorithmic problem. It's certainly NP hard. And furthermore, the, it's not enough to just find any panel that satisfies all these constraints, but the selection algorithm should do so in a random way that recovers some of the nice properties of the simple one, sta uh, one stage procedure on the last slide. So this is a hard algorithmic problem, but before our project, practitioners simply did not think about this as something that would involve computer scientists. Many different organizations have internally uh, developed their own procedures for selecting this panel. And many of them just involve a lot of dice and very long Excel sheets. Some of them use computer programs, but all of them are a bit ad hoc. And they have more or less success in finding panels that satisfy all these, uh, all these quotas at once. But they can't really afford to pay any attention to what the randomness in this process really is doing and whether it's serving its purpose. And specifically, what we're interested in in this project is what we call the selection probabilities. So we look at different members of the pool and their probability of being selected by the selection algorithm to the panel. I would like to show you how this plays out in an existing algorithm, maybe the most uh, sophisticated one before our analysis, uh, which we call legacy, and on a real data set from a real citizens assembly. I'm going to show you here a histogram of these selection probabilities. So on the x-axis, there are different selection probabilities, and on the y-axis, there's their frequency. And this is what this looks like. So it's not too bad, but it's quite widely dispersed. There are a bunch of people who have a selection probability around 20%, but Mostly, there's a very fat tail towards 0%. zero percent. Many different people have selection probabilities that are very low. And we actually find that some people have incredibly low selection probabilities, around 0.05%. So these people 
are essentially just barred from participating in, in the panel and not due to anything that, that would be fundamental because we definitely can't give everybody an equal chance. If, if highly educated people are overrepresented, the selection algorithm should represent them at lower rates than the, lower, than the people with lower educational attainment. But what we see here is not some, something arising really from the constraints of the problem, but an artifact of how this selection algorithm tries to satisfy all these quotas. And so this is disconcerting that we're excluding people based on this. And this is why our, um, our project has aimed to develop a new set of selection algorithms that aim to make these selection probabilities as equal as possible within the constraints imposed by the quotas. So we would like this histogram to be as close to equality as allowed. And of course, there are different ways of quantifying closeness to equality. For this, we lean on the literature in economics and in fair division. And for the purposes of this talk, I will just concentrate on a single metric of inequality, which is Leximin. And if you've never heard of that, you can just think about it um, as maximizing the lowest selection probability. So we want to ha not have any bar at the zero percentage, uh, at zero percent selection probability. And ideally, we wouldn't want to have any bars at 1% either. We want to just push up the leftmost uh, bar that is not zero. And this is what this algorithm actually can do. So here you see a different histogram and it is not equal. There's more than a single bar, but there are very few of them. And none of them is quite so close to zero, uh, anywhere as close to zero as these people who had 0.05% selection probability. So we have um, implemented this, this algorithm and I can't really speak about any of the internals. We use uh, nice ideas from convex optimization, column generation, integer linear programming, and combine them in a nice way. Um, but we have implemented this algorithm in an open source tool that has been developed by the Sortition Foundation uh, and is already in use in other organizations. And we're currently setting up this uh, website, Panelot, where new organizations will hopefully have an even easier time adopting our selection algorithms. And I would like to end this talk just with a slide of some of the organizations that we've been working with. Some of these organizations have adopted our selection algorithm. Some of them have heavily influenced our, um, our approach and our understanding of the problem. Uh, many of them have shared data with us for our, for our analysis. But overall, there just has been a very uh, enriching and, and wonderful communication with all these very, very motivated and very uh, thoughtful people. And uh, that has been amazing. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the next talks and then the discussion.